Bonjour tout le monde, bienvenue. Uh, cette conférence, c'est uh, uh, leçon de gestion des années 1960, uh, mille, pardon, mille, cent, uh, 1960. Uh, malheureusement, mon français n'est pas le mieux, alors le reste de ce talk va être en anglais. Donc, please bear with me. Um, as we said, my name is Larry Garfield, or Krell online. If you want to make fun of me during the talk on Twitter, that's where you do so. I highly encourage it. <clears throat> uh, Director of Developer Experience for Platform SH. We're a hosting company, a cloud deployment company. Um, been around the PHP community for years. Uh, I was also one of the leads for Drupal 8, one of the lead developers for Drupal 8. Uh, so I'm going to reference Drupal a couple of times in this talk as an example of a large open source project. Nothing I'm saying here is Drupal specific, it's just an example. So let's start with a little history. This is a computer. This is a very old computer, specifically <clears throat> an IBM uh, System 360 Model 20. It was the, the IBM System 360 was the world's first complete range of computers, multiple models of computer that were compatible with each other. This is an incredible new concept in 1964 when it was announced. One of the key attributes of it was that it was one of the first systems to have a clear distinction between architecture and implementation because you were going to build multiple implementations, multiple different types of IBM System 360, and so you needed to have, you know, define separately what's common, what your architecture is between those different versions of this computer, which was a very novel concept in the 60s. Like uh, most project in technology, it was late and took two years to develop, but it ended up being one of the most influential projects in history. Specifically, it invented the concept of an 8-bit byte. Why is a byte 8 bits? Because IBM System 360 made it 8 bits. A lot of systems before that used a 6-bit byte instead of 8 bits. But, and fun story, um, 6 bits isn't enough to represent uppercase and lowercase characters. So the developers of, it, uh, of systems that use 6-bit systems tested and found that lowercase letters were easier to read than uppercase letters and took this conclusion to their boss and said we should make everything lowercase. And their boss said, but we're IBM. We can't have our name in lowercase letters. And so uh, all uppercase became the standard until System 360 with an 8-bit byte if you had enough room. The idea of addressing memory by byte rather than by individual bit offsets came from System 360. We take it for granted now, none of this was, is automatic. This is how System 360 defined things for the future. It also originated the EBCDIC uh, encoding format, which nobody, <coughs> nobody uses anymore. They use ASCII instead, or now UTF-8. So it does live on today as the IBM Z series, uh, which is one of the high-end supercomputers you can still buy still backward compatible for a lot of software written 40 years ago. will still run on these systems, and it does run PHP. The lead team for the system uh, consisted of Gene Amdahl and Fred Brooks as the architect and manager, respectively. In fact, it was Fred Brooks who coined the term computer architecture. He, that, the concept of architecture as a technological thing comes from Fred Brooks. After the project was over, pe people drifted off and worked on other projects, like you do. Both of these men ended up in uh, academia. And Brooks went on to write, 10 years later, a book called The Mythical Man Month. Who's heard of this? No one should be allowed to run a software project without reading this book. It's a series of essays and lessons learned from his experience working on System 360 and other academic studies in the intervening decade. In uh, 1986, 1986, he released an essay uh, called No Silver Bullet, <clears throat> and then in 1995, released a 20-year anniversary edition of the book to say, it's been 20 years, is this stuff still true? And the answer was yes. In 20 years, nothing really had changed. His conclusions about how to run large software projects were still true. So it's been another 20 years and change. 
Is it still true? Are these lessons still valid? I'm going to argue yes. Let's go through some of what Brooks talks about in the book and <clears throat> you know, see how much of it still applies to development today in 2017. Now, the first thing I'll call out that is not still valid is he uses male pronouns exclusively, like over the top, even for the 70s. So that's not valid. Everything we say here is completely gender agnostic, so bear with me on that. First point, who's heard of Brooks' Law? Adding people to a late software project makes it later. Who's heard of that one? Almost everyone here? Okay. Why is this the case? It's the case because communication is hard. Communication is really hard. And the more people you have, the more communication gets hard. Because when you add more people to a team, the number of communication channels goes up faster than the number of people. So you've got two people, we've got one channel, three people, we've got three channels, four people, there are six communication channels. Five people, there's 10 communication channels. This is a very simple mathematical series. Don't worry about the math, it doesn't actually matter. Point being, the more people you add, the more people have to talk to each other and that slows everything down. In part, because most tasks are not parallelizable. So management talks, so I have to have Dilbert. I heard, let's see, uh, I hired three, hired all of you because this project will take 300 days to complete. So I hired 300 of you. You're all fired. You want it done by the end of the day. This is, of course, ridiculous, but is how some people try to approach software development. Why is this the case? Sometimes the resources you need are limited. You have only so many computers, only so many test servers, um, only so, so many people who know how to use a database. People have different skill levels. You can have someone who is great at CSS and terrible at SQL, and someone who's great at SQL and terrible at CSS. You have only so many people. And some tasks are going to block others. You know, I can't do the CSS for the design until we know what functionality we need to design. I have to do one of these before I can do the other. People and months are interchangeable commodities only when the tasks can be partitioned among many workers with no communication between them. This is the only case where you can actually throw people at a problem to solve it, is when there is no communication between them. If we add two more people to this project, how long will it take? Well, add one month to train them, one month for the extra complexity of communicating with them, and an extra month to deal with their drama because humans suck. The number of people you can add to a project depends on the swim lanes. It's a concept from agile development. It's the number of independent lines of work you can work on at the same time without bumping into each other. That determines the maximum number of people that you can put onto a project. I will normally say it's number of swim lanes plus one. So you have some overlap. You have someone who's just doing QA. You have space for someone to go on vacation. That is as many people as you can reasonably put on a project. If you add more people to a project than that, it will get slower. Notice that developer doesn't mean number of people involved. This doesn't count your project manager, does not count uh, the salespeople. This is just the number of people working on building the system. So that's Brooks's claim. What do you think? Still true? 40 years later, still true? Yep. Yep. So true, in fact, that uh, while well, putting this talk together, I observed that I, I'm not covering the whole book. There's at least two talks worth of content in this book. And so someone helpfully suggested I get a second speaker on stage and give both of the talks at the same time, and then we'll be able to get through the whole book. No, no, that doesn't work at that guy. So do we know projects? Do, have we worked on projects that like to throw people at the problem and solve a, a problem by just adding more warm bodies? Every large open source project, every single large open source project is desperate for more warm bodies to just throw at a problem, which is a problem. How many developers does Drupal have? Oh, 3,700. You could substitute in Symfony, Zend, Laravel, anything, any major open source project has tons of developers on it. Next up. Why are estimates always wrong? 
Who's had an estimate that actually worked? Your est estimate was spot on. One person is going to admit it. Every time? No, no. Why? Because what you are estimating is the time it takes to write the program. You are not estimating the time it takes to create a programming system's product. What does that mean? The program is the prototype. It's the thing you bang out in your garage. Making that into a proper programming system, which means putting proper interfaces on it, doing good system integration, making sure those interfaces are stable, documenting the API, takes three times as much effort, Brooks argues, as doing the initial prototype. Three times as much effort to flesh it out and do it right. If you want to make an actual programming product, again, let's make that um, the system really stable, that means you need to take time to generalize it, do testing, uh, build your documentation, uh, factor in maintenance, three times as long as the initial system. Which means if you're building a full programming system product that is a platform, a tool that is well t tested, robust, that people can build on top of cleanly, you're talking about nine times the effort of building that initial prototype. Brooks argues this is nine times more work. Now, we're talking about testing as a, something you need to add in that makes things take longer. He s observes a substantial, test, a substantial bank of test cases exploring the input range and probing its boundaries must be prepared, run, and recorded. Writing in 1975, meaning automated testing was already something people were talking about in the mid-70s. You have no excuse to not be doing testing at all. Automated testing is an old, old concept, and there's nothing new about it. And it's not that testing makes things take three times longer, it's fixing all the bugs that testing finds takes three times longer. You're going to fix them either way, you might as well fix them in the first place and factor that into your development. Also, how fast can you code? Who, th who thinks they know how fast they can produce code? You're wrong. Because it depends on how much code you already have. Extrapolation of time for the 100 yard dash shows a man can run a mile in, in under three minutes. Because that's, you know, if you can run 100 yards, 100 meters, in this amount of time, then multiply that up to a mile, it should tell you how much time it takes to go that far. Except, no, it doesn't work that way. You can't run at the same speed. The current world record for uh, uh, the fastest mile is three minutes, 43 seconds. In fact, studies even back in the 70s found that the amount of effort needed to produce a chunk of code was a factor of the number of instructions raised to a power. The more instructions you're writing, the longer it takes per instruction to write it. This is true even if there is no communication, even if you do not need to talk to anyone, if you, if you are not working with anyone else there are more interaction points internally in the code, your ability to hold the code and the program in memory, in your own memory, is limited. The larger the program, the longer it takes you to add more code to it. What are we looking at in terms of hard numbers? So again, from the early 70s, these, uh, these numbers, uh, a study by Joel Aaron found that a person could produce about 10,000 instructions per year if there were very, very few interactions with other people. All the way up to lots of interaction, it goes down by almost an order of magnitude. And in this case, large systems, we're talking a team of 25 people and 30,000 instructions. Who here is on a development team with more than 25 people? I'm impressed, one person. Yeah, there's a natural limit to the number of people you can put on a team. Now, this study was run on code written in assembly, early 70s. But is it true for anything else? Another study followed up using PL1, which is the, the C equivalent from the 60s and 70s, and found the exact same pattern based on the number of statements in it. Meaning, the amount, the, it does not matter what language you're in or how powerful that language is, more code means you will code slower. However, more power, more expressiveness per statement in a language means you can still get more done for less code. So a more expressive, more powerful language 
does matter to productivity and matters more the larger your program gets. But no matter what, you still run into that problem of the larger program takes longer to write per line of code. You slow down as you go. What do you think? That's still true as well? That, that fit with your experience? I'd say yes, that's definitely my experience. Of course, we just said large systems with high complexity and lots of communication is 25 people and 30,000 instructions. That's a lot more than 25 people. How many lines of code are in Drupal 8? That's a lot more than 30,000. How many lines of code are in your code base? Uh-huh, you should be worried right now. So what can we learn from this? Let's talk about documentation. Who, who spends a lot of time writing documentation? There's nowhere near enough hands up. Because only when one writes do the gaps appear and inconsistencies protrude. The act of writing turns out to require hundreds of mini decisions, and it's the existence of these that distinguishes clear, exact policy from fuzzy ones. Documenting your system, especially if you document it in advance and describe what it's supposed to do, is like rubber ducking with your word processor. The process of trying to explain what it is you need the program to do reveals all the hundred places where you don't know what you want it to do yet. But the manual or the written specification is a necessary tool, but not a sufficient one. The code is a formal definition. It is precise, but not all that readable usually, even if you're writing in a, you know, a clean fashion. And it doesn't explain the why. You need the why for things. That is what documentation is for, both separate documentation and inline documentation in the code itself. When I joined Platform SH a year and a half ago, I was completely lost on how our system worked because we didn't have really good solid documentation. First thing I did was start working on that. We now have much better documentation and it takes far less time to bring new people onto the team because they can understand how the system is put together and why. It makes it easier for us to onboard new customers too. Brooks argues that this requires top-down design, which means architect the system first. Don't just start coding, architect the system first and refine top down from your high level picture of what the system is supposed to do to produce modules and submodules, and keep breaking that problem down and that is your architecture, is your problem broken down into discrete pieces that you can then work on. Which you can then uh, work on independently, debug independently, and as you find issues, inform back up. This is an iterative process where your, document, your work should inform your architecture. It's not strictly you know, top-down, set in stone. Basically, divide and conquer, which is the best way to approach any problem in any science, computer or otherwise. Brooks also observes, you should plan to throw away your first version because you're going to do it anyway, whether you do it all at once or piecemeal. Because until you've done it wrong once, you don't actually know what the right way is. It's just guaranteed. Who's heard the statement, you know, never ship your version one, or um, the, the joke, Microsoft takes three versions to get something right? That's what we're talking about here. Because the first version, you don't actually know what you're going to do with it. Now, at this point, someone in the room is probably about to say, but Larry, you're talking about waterfall development. Isn't that terrible? Aren't we supposed to do Agile these days? Well, kind of. In Brooks's follow-up, uh, edition in 95, he says, yeah, that does sound kind of waterfall-y now that you mention it. So let's revise it, not throw it away, but let's revise it. Start by building an end-to-end -end skeleton of the system, your high-level architecture with pieces stubbed out, but you're an end-to-end -end, uh, skeleton of the system. And make sure it compiles or runs and executes whatever you're, you're talking about. You know, in PHP, make sure it returns a 200 response or whatever. And then grow modules in place. Slot in additional functionality into this skeleton as you go. This initial skeleton could be a third of your entire program. It's not 
you know, a one week job or a one day job. It's not just installing Symphony or Laravel and you're done. That's not the skeleton. The skeleton is what your entire big picture is supposed to look like. This could take a while, but it lets you iteratively add real functionality rather than stubbed out fake functionality and lets you re refactor individual pieces. It lets you throw away modules one at a time rather than the whole system at once. Refactoring is the art of throwing away a little bit at a time. That's what refactoring is. It's saying the first version was terrible, I'm gonna replace it with the second version bit by bit. This is good. But this approach still necessitates top-down design because it is top-down growing of the software. You have that skeleton in place, that big picture in place, and then you are iteratively adding functionality and fleshing out functionality to it, but you need that initial baseline built. Common sense, if not common practice, dictates that one should begin system debugging only after the pieces work. You need to be able to debug those individual pieces separately from each other. Build standalone libraries that you can test and then plug into your system. Otherwise, you have no clue where the bug is. Architect top down, debug bottom up. Now again, someone's probably looking at this and saying, but isn't that just Agile? Or, but Agile says, Who's thinking that? No one's gonna own up to it? Okay, I'm, I know someone is. You've probably seen pictures like this where, you know, this is not how you build a minimum file product. This is. Who has ever successfully turned a bicycle into a car? No one. This is a terrible way to design, thinking that you can turn a quick throwaway into a real robust system. You need to know what your end system is going to look like and build a skeleton that will support that. You start with, your basic frame, and then you can you know, add a trunk, then you can add doors, and then you can change the doors and change the hubcaps, and you can evolve the system, yes, do that. But you need to start with a structure that is going to support your end system, and decouple components you can slot into that system. Because if you need to change that base system, if you need to swap out you know, the, the, the A-frame of the car, that is incredibly expensive even if everything else is well written. That is incredibly expensive. Which means, contrary to what Agile says, you know, pure Agile says you deliver the most important features first and just keep working down that line. No, you deliver a baseline first. You deliver the foundation first. The most important feature of a house that someone is building may be that it has three bathrooms in it. But the first thing you do is you build the foundation and pour concrete. It does not matter how many bathrooms it has, you need that concrete built for, poured first. That foundation must come first. What do you think, still true? This makes sense? This, yeah? I'm gonna give them two and a half for three so far. In 1986, um, Brooks gave it a presentation that he turned into an article called No Silver Bullet, in which he drew a line between essential complexity an accidental complexity. In this case, <clears throat> essential complexity are things that are just inherently hard in the problem space. The problem you're trying to solve is a complicated one. Accidental complexity or incidental complexity is the tools you are using are cumbersome and hard to use. They're not inherent in the problem space. The hard part of building software is the specification, design, and testing of the conceptual construct not the labor of representing it and testing the fidelity of the representation. Remember, in the 60s and 70s, this is a time when to run your program to see if it worked, you took your stack of punch cards down the hall to the elevator, went down three floors, walked over to where the computer was, handed it to the computer operator who ran your punch cards, found there's an error on punch card 417, here's your punch cards back, That's a lot of accidental complexity of that time of walking downstairs and, and uh, running the system. We've gotten a long, lot better since then. We now have our computers on our desks. We have more than one of them. We can debug software directly on the computer. We have languages that do managed memory so we don't have to worry about null pointers if you're smart. So we have made huge strides since then and we've run out of huge strides to make. 
In the mid-80s, we had run out of huge strides to make. There is no single development which by itself promises even one order of magnitude improvement in productivity, reliability, reliability or simplicity. Room for improvement? Absolutely. Language improvements, improvements in technique, improvements in process, they matter. There is improvement to make. But we're not going to see something that takes a 500-hour project and makes it a 10-hour project. Those don't exist anymore. There are no more problems like that to solve. So how do we attack that essential complexity, the, the actual hard part? <clears throat> First thing Brooks recommends is rapid prototyping that lets you grow a system organically based on user feedback. We already talked about this. That's growing a system in place. The second is buy versus build, and then mentoring better architects. <clears throat> he points out the most radical possible solution for constructing software is to not construct it at all. Originally, hardware, computer hardware, would cost $20 million. If you're spending $20 million on a, on a computer, spending $50,000 to custom write every line of code for it is a rounding error. No, no one cares about that. You can now get fully functional computers this big that are $10, which means the software is comparatively extremely expensive to write because hardware has gotten so much cheaper. <clears throat> so how do you uh, avoid writing lots of expensive software? By reusing it more. By writing software, writing code that you can reuse, writing tools you can reuse. No one in their right mind writes a spreadsheet program anymore. There's already several in the market you can just use. It's very rare that you have any justification for writing a new web server. There are several in the market you can just use. He, the term didn't exist yet, but we just described open source. The entire point of open source is write something once well and share it so that you don't have to write it a second time. He was saying this in 1986. So yeah, the, the num this is the number one improvement in productivity in the last 20 years in, in software development is reusable open source code. If you are not already using mostly open source code in your business, you are throwing away money. Period. And finally, we need to grow great designers. Notice a shift here, architect and designer. Because software construction is fundamentally a creative process. Software architecture is much more like graphic design than it is engineering. It's not the same as programming. Architecture and design are very, very different than programming. It's a separate skill set that needs recognition as a distinct separate skill set that is on the level of management in terms of how important it is and how um, much status within a company, within an organization, someone should have. Study after study have shown that the very best designers produce structures that are faster, smaller, simpler, cleaner, and produced with less effort. The difference between the great and the average approach in order of magnitude. Oh my god, 10x developer, you're just discriminating. No, no. 10x architect. Nobody is going to write code 10 times faster than your mid-range developer. Doesn't exist. But if you can design the system in such a way that you need 10 times less code to get the job done, now you're talking. That's good design. That's good architecture. And it has nothing to do with how fast you can code a loop. Completely irrelevant. This is designing the system in such a way that it requires less effort to produce in the first place. How do we get people who can do this? Through mentoring. Through real, honest to goodness, formal mentoring. Identify candidates early in their career who are good architects. These people may or may not be good programmers. It is a different skill. Someone who's a junior programmer who is not that stellar, they're okay, but they're not stellar at coding, may be a very good architect with the right training. So give them a career mentor. Give them formal apprenticeships, formal education in design. Let them take classes. Send them to conferences like this one. Give them a chance to, to work either solo or with other designers at your company or at another company. Work in open source. Time to flex these design muscles. These are all things that the graphic design world does. This is how the design world develops talent. This is how the software world should be developing our design talent. 
architecture is design, and we need to do, we need to treat that with the respect and effort and attention of any other design field. What do you think? Is he right? Is he right? I'm going to say, oh, heck yeah. This absolutely fits my experience in working in uh, both open source and at companies. And finally, let's talk about conceptual integrity. The conceptual integrity of a product, as perceived by the user, is the most important factor in ease of use. As perceived by the user. How easy to use something is, is not a simple, you know, oh, this is easier than that. It's a function of how much power and functionality you get for the amount of conceptual complexity you need to learn to be able to use it. A 3D modeling tool like 3D Studio Max or Blender or Lightwave, those are incredibly complicated. They take forever to learn. But <clears throat> the amount of power you get out of that, the amount of flexibility you get out of that is enormous. At the other end of the, of the scale, Windows Notepad takes no effort at all to learn and can do almost nothing. So you could argue those are equally easy to learn. Notepad and Blender are equally easy to, easy to use, given the power and functionality they give you. It's a relative co concept. <clears throat> so what you want to do is maximize the functionality you have and minimize the conceptual complexity that a user needs to keep track of. Simplicity and straightforwardness proceed from conceptual integrity. You should have one mental model of the system. Conceptual integrity, Brooks argues, is the most important consideration in system design. It is better to have a consistent design, a consistent mental model, than to have more functionality. In fact, very often the products that win in the marketplace are those that have fewer features, but better conceptual integrity. See also iPhone. The conceptual integrity of product not only makes it easier to use, but easier to build and less subject to bugs. Because just as the user only needs one mental model to keep track of, the developer needs only one mental model to keep track of. Domain-driven design, who's heard of that phrase? Same concept, one mental model to have to think about, one set of nouns to think about, means the system is easier to build and you're gonna have fewer mismatches in the system. So how do you get a consistent conceptual integrity? <clears throat> Through smart division of labor. And we say division of labor because the design must proceed from one mind or a very small number of agreeing resident minds. This means you don't have everybody working on every part of the system. That doesn't work. What you want to have is someone steering the ship, someone leading, by splitting the architect and the implementer. Those are different job roles. We're not encouraging monothink, but you want to ensure that there's a consistent vision. If you have multiple people in this role, they should all have the same clear vision. If they have different conflicting visions, you're going to have a crap system. Even if both of those visions are viable, mixing the two together produces crap. The architect is the user's agent. It is their job to bring professional and technical knowledge to bear in the unalloyed interest of the user, as opposed to the salesman or the fabricator. <clears throat> and at some point, now someone is about to say, but open source, cathedral and bazaar, that's a cathedral design, that's, you know, isn't that terrible? Cathedrals stand for centuries. A bazaar lasts for a year. How long has Notre Dame been standing? That was top-down architecture. Wouldn't you like your software to last as long as Notre Dame? That'd be really cool, wouldn't it? Apple, a company very well known for its design of, of its products, and they've got lots of designers, lots of engineers, but at the end of the day, Johnny Ives is calling the shots. It is his vision that drives the product. Google has tons of designers on different products, but at the end of the day, Matthias Duarte is the one calling the shots. His vision, his design is the one that wins. If you're using any Unix-based system, POSIX is the standard you're using. That is the vision. If you try and write code that goes against the grain, you end up with a terrible Unix program because it is not following the standard, not following the pattern. If you do anything on the web, you're following HTTP. If you break HTTP, you broke your application, period. Yes, this means you don't get to design the network protocol. Tier, I don't care. This is how the system works. This is the architecture you work within it. 
The architect needs to always be prepared to show an implementation, but not necessarily dictate the implementation. <clears throat> the implementer gets to decide how it gets built, as long as the architect has confirmed it is possible to build. Asking someone to build something that's impossible will not get you a good product. But it's up to the imp implementer, the programmer, to decide how it gets built. This is an ongoing cooperative effort with lots and lots of communication. You need to have constant regular communication. If you have a larger system, you break it up into pieces and have sub-architects for different parts of the system, which also reduces your communication channels. Your lead architect communicates with your sub-architects, and they communicate with the, the implementers in their areas. You have vastly fewer communication lines now that you need to worry about. I don't need to worry about talking to people working on a different team. That's a communication line we can get rid of. You want this. Democratic architecture in software produces a big ball of mud. Having worked on open source for 12 years, I speak from a great deal of painful experience. So do we know any systems that don't have any lead architect, don't have anyone really defining a vision for the system that is therefore kind of muddy and inconsistent and annoying to use at times? What should we learn from this? Now we're talking about large systems. How, how big are we talking? Well, according to Brooks, after teaching a software engineering laboratory more than 20 times, I came to insist that student teams as small as four people choose a manager and separate architect. Four, that's a big team. Manager, archi lead architect, <clears throat> and two implementers. Either the, the architect or the manager can be the, the boss, the one actually calling the shots and with final authority. It doesn't matter which one it is as long as everyone agrees which one it is. Project manager, architect, and implementers for a team of four. So what we sh should we be learning from this? Software construction is a creative process. It is much closer to uh, any other artistic field in practice than it is to traditional engineering. Divide and conquer should be your first approach to almost any problem. If it's complicated, break it down into constituent parts. Separate out the pieces, solve them separately. That applies to both the code and to the people process that produces the code. Your goal should always be to try and produce shareable programming system products, which you then release as open source. Or use someone else's open source that's close enough and save yourself all of the time of producing that. You want to decouple your libraries from your framework as much as possible so that you can produce shareable programming system products, so that you can test them individually and validate them individually before reassembling everything. This requires top-down design. Throwing code at a system in agile style until it works will produce crap. You need a top-down big picture vision of the system that you can then iterate on and that top-down vision needs to come from a clear, empowered architect who is able to make decisions and have them stick even if someone disagrees, rather than just arguing about it forever. That is what we, what we can learn from four decades of ignoring this advice. Because it, the idea that people knew a thing or two in the 70s is kind of strange to a lot of young programmers. I believe he said this in the early 90s. Do you know who Donald Knuth is? Look him up. You probably should. What can we learn from this? Thank you. And I think that's just about time, so I don't think I can take any questions here. Um, but if you have any other questions, I will be at the Platform SH booth just right across the hallway here. Come find me. Uh, happy to answer any questions and give you stickers as well. So thank you. Merci.